the Churches of Christ present Bible Talk. Oh, be careful, little eyes, of what you see, ears what you hear, hands what you do, feet where you go, and tongue what you say. These words compose a, a child song, but in them is a great lesson on godliness. Stay tuned for a lesson on godliness from a child song. Lord. Hello again, and thank you for tuning into Bible Talk today. It's my utmost prayer that the program finds you today in the best of health, both physically and spiritually. As always, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to study with you today, and I pray that today's lesson is a blessing to your life and to your walk with Christ. Sometimes, some of the greatest lessons can be learned with a childlike simplicity. I think that's at least part of the reason that Jesus said what He said in Matthew 18 and verse 3 when He said, Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The, the mind of a child is, is innocent, it, it's pure, it, and, and it's simple. And because of that, sometimes things are clearer to them than it is even to us as adults. And it really shouldn't surprise us then that sometimes we can learn great lessons from a childlike perspective. When it comes to, to godliness, there are some things that must be avoided. Godliness, we know in short, is God-likeness. It's, it's striving to be as much like God as humanly possible. But in an effort to live godly, we must also consider the things that take away from our godliness. And Paul wrote about it in this way when he wrote to Titus. In Titus 2, 11 and 12, Paul said, "...for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men." teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and notice godly in this present age. In other words, in order to live soberly, righteously, and godly, then ungodliness and worldly lust must be denied. And it's in this simple child song, in innocence and simplicity, that I believe we find the words that can help us and remind us to do that very thing, to deny ungodliness and worldly lust that we might live soberly, righteously, and godly. The song you know is the song, Be Careful Little Eyes. And if we want to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, we must, number one, be careful of what we see. You know, our eyes are something that we must keep on guard. Think about the way that sin was categorized by John in 1 John 2 and verse 16. You have the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. 
I think about 2 Peter 2 and verses 6 through 8 where Peter writing about Lot said that that righteous man had his righteous soul vexed day after day by the things that he saw and heard. What Lot saw in those cities of the plains affected him. It, it vexed his righteous soul. You think about those examples that we have through the scriptures of individuals who sinned or were led down the path of sin because of their eyes. Even in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, when Eve saw that the tree was good to eat, that the fruit of the tree was good to eat, then she fell to that temptation. Now she also fell to the other two aspects of sin, the, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. But the lust of the eyes was there, and the lust of the eyes helped lead her down the path to eat of the fruit, to violate the commandment of God. Think about David, the man after God's own heart, 2 Samuel 11. And David, we know, should have been away with his men at war. It was the time when kings go to war, but David's at home David's walking upon his rooftop. And you know the story. You know the account of David and Bathsheba well. But it was when David looked after her. And then he lusted for her and sent for her. Where did it begin? Well, some would say it began with David being in a place where he shouldn't have been. And, and I say amen to that. But also it began with his eyes. He looked at her, lusted for her, and sent for her. You know, the Lord taught that looking can lead to lusting, which leads to adultery, Matthew 5 and verse 28. Jesus said, if a man looks after a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery already in his heart. The emphasis for us then in taking care in what we see, we must be careful of the things that we watch, the things that we allow to influence our mind and our lives through our eyes. You know, one of the greatest problems today is the issue of pornography. And, and I know it's not a comfortable subject and, and I want to be as tactful as possible when dealing with it, but friends, it must be addressed. It's, it's destroying homes, it's destroying lives, and it's undermining God's plan for intimacy in the bonds of marriage. And yet it continues to grow, it continues to spread like a cancer. Some things I want you to think about, and surely some of these numbers have changed, but did you know that in 2003, the pornography industry brought in more revenue than Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Netflix, and Apple to the tune of $97 billion. Another study from 2003 that was done by the Barna Research Group found that 59% of adults, 59, over half of adults, believe that it was morally acceptable to have these kinds of thoughts and fantasies. And 38% of those same individuals didn't see anything wrong with using it. Absolutely nothing wrong with using pornography. Think about that. Over half of adults and 38% saw nothing wrong with it. You say, well, those aren't Christians. What about, what about quote-unquote Christians? A 2007 article by Jason Rovu stated that 70% of Christians admitted to struggling with it. In the year 2000, the National Coalition to Protect Children surveyed five Christian colleges and found that 68% of the males there said that they had viewed it, that they had seen it. And here's the thing, it can start so easily. Even for women, 20% of quote-unquote Christian women said or admitted that they too had watched pornography. It began and it can start with such a simple little thing. You know, maybe it starts with a movie or with a television show. Maybe flipping through some catalog or social media. But friends, like all sin, when we give into it, it waxes worse and worse. The truth is, is that it's addictive. Due to the chemicals that are released in the brain whenever one views such images, it causes us to come back to it time and time again. And friends, it will destroy your life and the lives of your children. In Matthew 6, 22-24, Jesus said that the eyes are the window to the soul, the light to the rest of the body. And if we want to increase in godliness, we must be careful of what we see. Let us be like Job, Job 31 and verse 1. And let us make a covenant with our eyes. Let us pray as did the psalmist, Psalm 119 and verse 37, to turn our eyes from looking at worthless things. We've got to be careful 
of what we see. Secondly, we must be careful of what we hear if we want to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Think again back to Lot, 2 Peter 2 and, and verses 6 to 8. Remember that that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous sovereign that day. It was not only the things which Lot saw, but it was also the things which he heard. Think also about the example of Rehoboam in 1 Kings chapter 12. Rehoboam was uh, an individual who was uh, seceding his father upon the throne, the, the, the wise King Solomon. Rehoboam, in taking the throne, had some choices before him. See, Solomon in all of his wisdom had done some great things, but he had also placed, uh, placed a heavy burden upon the people. And so the people come to Rehoboam and they say, give us, a, you know, give us some reprieve, ease our burden. And Rehoboam seeks the counsel of the same wise men who had advised the wisest king that had ever lived. And they say to Rehoboam, you know, give them a break. You know, give them some reprieve. But then Rehoboam turns to his friends. And he heeded the advice of his younger counsel, of his friends. And they said, listen, you know what, Rehoboam? The reason that the people are asking this of you is because they don't really respect you as king. And Rehoboam chose to listen to them and that decision split the kingdom. And from that day forward there was a divided kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Rehoboam should have taken more care as to whom he was, to whom he was listening. And then again that example of Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. It's always been sort of a, astounding to me to consider why she was listening to the serpent in the first place. And, and, and listen, things were different in the garden. We don't know everything about how... It, maybe it was completely normal for them to talk to, to, to the animals in the garden. I, you know, I, I don't know. We could speculate. But that's always to that. Why was it not a strange thing that the serpent was speaking in the first place? Regardless, if only she had turned her ears from listening to the deceitfulness of Satan. The emphasis for us and what we need to consider is that what we lend our ears to can be just as detrimental as what we see. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, Paul said, Evil companionship corrupts good morals. And when we surround ourselves with, with people using foul language and, and improper speech, speech unbecoming of Christ and Christians, uh, eventually that works its way into our vocabulary and into our thoughts. There's also a warning here about being careful to whom we lend an ear. In 2 Peter 4 and verse 2 and following, Paul told Timothy to preach the gospel, to be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time would come when they would not endure sound doctrine, but having each itching ears, they would heap to themselves teachers, that they would be turned away from the truth and be turned unto fables. We need to remember Galatians 1, 8, and 9 where Paul said, If we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It's also a reminder of not only to whom we listen in, in respect to making sure that we're listening to true and sound doctrine, but that we're also not taking part in gossip. In Proverbs 17 and verse 4, the, the Proverbs writer said, A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar gives ear to a naughty tongue. Have you ever considered that? See, sometimes we think about the gossiper as the one who's a liar. But the Proverbs writer said the hearer is a liar as well. And Revelation 21.8 says, All liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Let us take care of what we hear. Let us lend our ears to the truth and to that which edifies. To hear the beckon of the scriptures, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. If we want to add godliness to our lives and deny ungodliness and worldly lust, we must be careful of what we hear. But then number three, we need to be careful of what we do with our hands. The Bible and humanity is full of those who use their hands for wicked devices. You think about the hands of Cain in Genesis chapter 4 as he killed his brother. The hands of Aaron in Exodus chapter 32, when Moses tarried in the mound and the people came to Aaron and said, you know, Moses has tarried too long, make us a God. And the text tells us that Aaron took their gold, their jewelry, and with his own hands, he fashioned 
that golden calf for them to worship and declared these are the gods which brought you up out of the land of Egypt knowing good and well that it was Jehovah God the only true and living God who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. The hands of Cain killing his brother, the hands of, of Aaron making an idol for the people. Think about the hands of Achan in Joshua chapter 7 when he saw, again beginning with the eyes, he saw the wedge of gold and the shekels of silver and the goodly Babylonian garment and then with his hands he took those things and he buried them in his tent. And he cost God's people a victory against little Ai and sin was in the camp. Think about the hands of those who slapped and crucified our Lord. Matthew 26 details that that night of Jesus' uh, mock trial and how they slapped Him and spit upon Him and said, Prophesy unto us, who, who was it that smote thee? Who was it that smacked thee? And in Acts 2 and verse 23, you'll remember that Peter said, By wicked hands you have taken and crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we need to remember that we're going to give an account for what we do. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every man may give an account for the things done in this body whether it be good or bad. And we need to avoid having idle hands. Ezekiel 16 and verse 49. And, and I know that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of the abominable acts that they were committing. But that wasn't their only sin. In Ezekiel 16 and verse 49, Ezekiel lists some of those sins of the cities of the plains, and one of them is that they were growing in idleness. They were abundant in idleness. And that idleness led their imaginations to conceive of all kinds of abominable acts. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 11, Really, uh, other verses in 2 Thessalonians 3 as well, but there Paul encourages us to be workers, every man with his own hands, and not idle, because idle hands become busybodies in other men's matters. We want to avoid having idle hands. You remember the old expression, idle hands are the devil's playthings. Let us have hands that reach out and offer help, like the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Sometimes we get so caught up in pointing out the, the acts of the Samaritan that we forget the point of the whole story. And the point of the whole parable comes at the end when Jesus says, Go and do likewise. We need to reach out and offer help to those in need, whoever they are. Everyone is our neighbor and we need to reach out and help them. Let us have hands that, that point the way to Christ. Let us have hands that are willing to reach out and to spread the gospel message as the Great Commission has told us to do. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Let us have hands that are often folded in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Let us have hands that, that flip through our Bibles and, and search the Scriptures daily like the noble Bereans, Acts 17 and verse 11. I've often said, you show me a man whose Bible is falling apart and I'll show you a man whose life is not. Let us have hands that regularly and daily flip through the pages of Scripture studying the Word of God. We must be careful of what we do with our hands if we want to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And then number four, we need to be careful of where we go, of where our feet take us if we're going to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. You know, being in the wrong place can by itself lead to a disastrous end. Think about, again, David, the man after God's own heart. And where did his sin begin? By being in the wrong place. Again, you go back to 2 Samuel 11, and that chapter begins by telling us that it was the time when kings go off to war. But where was King David? He wasn't out on the battlefield with his men. He was at home, at his palace. If his feet had taken him where he was supposed to go, then perhaps David is never at home to see Bathsheba, to lust after her, and to sin for her. Think also about Lot. You know, Lot chose his place in the cities of the plains. You go back uh, to the book of Genesis, and there was that strife between his herdsmen and the herdsmen of Abraham. And Abraham, willing to be the, the peacemaker, said, You choose 
You choose where you want to be. And Lot chose the cities of the plains. And his righteous soul was vexed by the things that he both saw and heard because of where his feet took him, because of the place where he chose to make his abode. Think about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. And there's a, there's a lot that could be said from three words that he took his journey, took his journey into the far country. Uh, he demanded his inheritance and then his feet carried him away into the far country where he would consume his, his inheritance, waste it all on riotous or wicked living. The emphasis for us, friends, is that we need to avoid places of wickedness. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says to avoid all appearances of evil. And, and I know that that verse needs to be kept in its proper context, but it's still true that we need to avoid being in places where wickedness abounds and avoid being found in such. We need to be, not only, not only do we need to avoid being where we have no business being, but we also need to make sure that we are where we're supposed to be. Hebrews 10 and verse 25, the Hebrews writer said, Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. If we want to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, we need to avoid wicked places, but then we also need to be present in worship and be where we're supposed to be. Ultimately, we need to be holy, seeking to live holy lives wherever we go, as did Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel purposed in his heart not to be defiled by the king's meat. And he did so after he had been far removed from his home, carried to a strange land, to a strange king, given a strange name, and yet still he chose holiness. Let us seek to live holy lives wherever we may be. And then let us go forth and share the gospel message. Romans 10, 15 said, How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good tidings of glad things, or glad tidings of good things. And then Ephesians 6 and verse 15, Paul said that part of that armor of God that we're to put on is feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. And then finally, friends, to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, we need to be careful of what we say. More people have fallen in the pursuit of godliness because of their tongues than for any other reason. James warned of the power of the tongue, James 3, 3 through 8, and even emphasized that that the tongue, if you can tame it, you're able to tame the whole body because it's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. We also need to keep in mind that speech reveals the heart. Matthew 12, 34, Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it reveals our true selves. Let us use our, spree, our speech to praise God, Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let us make sure that we're using our speech for spreading the gospel, Romans 10 and verse 14. Let us make sure that we use our speech not to tear someone down, but to build up the body of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. And again, Hebrews 10 and verse 24, provoking one another unto love and to good works. Let us make sure that we're using our speech for prayer. Again, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. If we want to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, we'll have to be careful of what we say. Whether or not we're able to live soberly, righteously, and godly is impacted by the things that we see, what and who we listen to, what we do with our hands, where we go, and what we say. The song says, Do all of this, because there's a Father up above and He's looking down with love. God is looking down today and we must ask the question, is He pleased with what our eyes are watching? Is He pleased with what our ears are hearing? Is He pleased with what our hands are doing? Is He pleased with where our feet are going? Is He pleased with what our tongues are saying? And friends, if not, then we need to make it right today. There's no better time than the present. I pray that you'll do that if need be. And I pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you and to your life. Thank you again for tuning in today. And God bless.
Do you have any questions about the Bible? Are you searching for a place to worship God like you find in the Bible? Do you have questions about your eternity? Would you like to know more about God's plan for you? Let me encourage you to visit a church of Christ near you today. And if you're interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, we also offer free material. For more information or if you would like to have a transcript or a copy of today's program, whether audio or video, please go to our website at www.bible-talk.org or you can email us at bible.talk at bible-talk.org. You can also write to us at Bible Talk, P.O. Box 40, Fayette, Alabama, 35555. Simply include the program number, and we'll be happy to send that to you completely free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in, and may God bless you richly in your walk with Him. Singing provided by the Edmund Church of Christ, Edmund, Oklahoma, producers of In Search of the Lord's Way. You can visit their website at www.searchtv.org.